I'm good at falling in love with people I can't have. My name is Andrea, and this is An Old Child. Welcome back to Adult Child, where we take a deep dive into the impact of growing up in a dysfunctional family. Ahoy, shit shows. Welcome aboard. Shit show nation. (laughs) I realized that I didn't do it in the last episode, and um, you probably were hoping that I was just going to let this one die. I'm not. Just letting you know that. For any new listeners, I am an acquired taste. You're either going to be really into this shit or not at all. I'm fully aware of that. So today, we are diving deep with returning guest, who I have deemed uh, queen of of abandonment, psychotherapist, author, Susan Anderson. And thank God for this woman, because she is one of the pioneers that has done the work, done the research to figure out how to help us damn shit shows, you know, without people like her, we didn't stand a chance. So extremely, extremely grateful for her. So I just started reading uh, one of her other books, Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and Healing from Abandonment. Now I'm going to let her talk about what uh, outer child is, but in essence, if you are familiar with the term In our teenager, it's pretty similar. It is the reactive part of us inside. It is the one that that acts out. And so this could not be more relevant for me right now. I was thinking about this today, how this podcast is a vessel for me to continue to heal what's not healed, the self-doubt, the self-sabotage, all that stuff, and to have you guys supporting me and I'm able to share stuff that there's shame attached to it, but I'm able to share it with all y'all because I know that you get me and I know that you're not judging me. I know that you guys accept me and what a gift that is. Thanks for being a part of this wild ride with me, truly. So I've started to do the exercises that she has within this book uh, and have had some insights, but I'm going to wait to to share that with y'all so that you can hear all about this outer child shit first from the woman who deemed the term. So we're talking about outer child and we're talking about why we are attracted to emotionally unavailable people. Our, Our favorite thing, our favorite pastime of being attracted to emotionally unavailable people. Talk about a damn good time. So let's just get the show on the road um, because this is a a goodie. But let's first take care of business. Number one, damn the joint Patreon. You again, the one that has been wanting to sign up for for a long time and hasn't. How about we change that, okay? Next, give me a little follow on the Instagram, on the TikTok. You guys, I'm about to hit 50,000 people on Instagram. So my birthday's on Friday. So if, you know, maybe you could just go up to random people in your life or, or just, uh, yeah, use somebody else's phone and just give me a little follow, right? It can't hurt. I would appreciate it. The Lord's work, in my opinion. You can also do the Lord's work and your charitable services by giving me a damn star, five-star review. Actually, no, this isn't an act of charity. This is actually a job requirement for being a podcast listener here. So how about you go do that? Thank you very much. Love you. All right, guys, I got back one of my faves, one of my fave guests. We have Susan Anderson, the, uh, I call, I think I called you the abandonment queen last time the queen of the abandonment <laughs> welcome back <laughs> nice to be here yeah i'm excited i've been excited for this chat so on saturdays i have i call it shit show saturday and that's where i interview my people in my community 
So this is what I always ask them. I say, number one, what's your favorite carb? So what's your favorite carb? Bread. What kind? Any kind of bread with any kind of thing on it. Could be butter, could be anything. Bread with something on it, anything. If I could only eat one food for the rest of my life, it would be bread. As long as I can put something on it. You're my kind of gal. Okay. Cheese. Favorite kind of cheese. Oh, gee, I love brie. I, lo I love Stilton. Um, many feta. All the cheeses. All the cheeses. And then condiment. Um, gee, I don't know. Hot. Something hot sauce. Right. The hotter, the better. So I have this weird theory and it's been, I've been collecting data for the past like year and a half, but this is what I think. I think that anxious attachers, they love their condiments, love condiments, want it on everything. And avoidance, they like their shit plain, or maybe they like a mustard. And I have been collecting data and it's been like 90% accurate so far. That's interesting. Keep collecting data. That is really interesting. Isn't it? It's, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking like maybe could we like design like a, a treatment, like a, a type of therapy that's incorporating the condiments? <laughs> <laughs> Condiment therapy. Yeah. We'll just like force anxious people to just put ketchup on everything. <laughs> Okay, so I just discovered your book, uh, Taming the Outer Child. Oh, it's a good one. When did you write that? Um, that was the last book that I wrote. And I wrote it in like uh, 2009, 2010. But then I revised it and I added up-to-date research. So I want to um, read the full title is uh, Taming Your Outer Child, Overcoming Self-Sabotage and healing abandonment. Yes. Because the un the unresolved abandonment issues that are universal, we all have them. We all have unresolved abandonment because it's primal, so you can't really resolve it totally. You can only get in touch with it and work with the energy in a positive way if you know how. But unresolved abandonment expresses itself in self-sabotage. So Self-sabotage, which is the outer child, that's the part that breaks our diet and gets attracted to all the wrong people. The outer child is a manifestation of unresolved abandonment. So that's why it's universal, because we all have abandonment. We all have the primal wound. And then, therefore, we all try to medicate it and try to avoid stuff and try to cope with stuff through all kinds of automatic behaviors that we learned you know, when we were younger and more primitive and that we carry into adulthood and it, we use it to sabotage our, our lives. Yeah. That's like, the, that's what I'm really trying to work through now is just the way that um, self-sabotage is showing up in my life as it relates to like growing my podcast. And, and so for me, it's, and I've shared this, um, even though I'm embarrassed to share it like on the podcast, but like, I have a horrible problem with games on my phone. Like I'm a candy crush freak. Um, and what I've noticed or what I've been trying not to do is like, you know, this is not a new issue for me, but what I've noticed is that I've just been shaming the shit out of myself about it. And obviously that's not going to work, right? That's not helping. So I've really been trying to invite in um, a level of compassion and curiosity um, but reading this book, the, what, what I'm, I'm only, I don't know, 20% in, but God, there's, I mean, a lot of the exercises in there are just spot on. So can you explain, explain the difference between the inner child and the outer child? The inner child is the part that feels it's the part that has, you know, emotions and primal feelings like abandonment fear, or it's the part that feels jealous, or it's the part that wants somebody. It's the part that's attracted. It's the part that worries. It's the part that gets excited. It's the emotional part. It's governed by the emotional brain, um, which is mostly, you know, the amygdala in, in the brain, but it's much more complicated than that. But it's the emotional part of us. And then there's the part that acts on those emotions. And that is the outer child part. 
And then there's an adult. That's the cerebral cortex part, the adult, the executive in charge, the part that develops in our 20s and 30s. But the truth is most of us, and this includes me a great deal of the time, um, I can sound very mature and adult, but actually there's a lot of outer child operating all the time. Um, because even though I have a cerebral cortex, therefore I have a vocabulary and I have cliches and I can sound um, you know, reasonable, the motivation underneath it, why am I um, saying what I'm saying? Why am I doing what I'm doing? It could be to avoid dealing with an emotion or it could be a way of competing against someone else and trying to you know, prove myself to be better or many other motivations that have to do with the outer child. So you bring up the whole thing of playing games on your phone mm -hmm. and you say um, that you feel shame about it. Well, you've made two really good disclosures. So who authorized you to make those disclosures? Was it your adult cerebral cortex self that said, you know what? It'll help me if I say it. It'll help me to just bring it out in the open. Or was it a part of you that likes to um, challenge you know, is it a part of you that plays with people and likes to, you know, evince like low self-esteem things? Chances are it was an adult part, but I just, just so that we can really try to examine things. But what, so wait, so, but expand upon that second part. So what, that I'm trying to, um, that I'm, well, I'm, I'm saying it to shame myself in a way, even further. Right, let's say I have a fear of rejection, a fear of criticism. Okay. So I'm afraid that when I'm trying to impress someone and show my best side, that they will still find something to criticize. So the outer child says, well, go ahead and, and give them Just something to criticize. Okay. Beat yeah, them yeah. to the punch. Yeah. So that would be an outer yeah. child motivation. Okay. But yeah. if... But so anyway, let's assume that we're, we're just giving you the benefit of the doubt just for the sake Thank of it. Thank you. Just, Thanks, Susan. It'll take us 10 minutes <laughs> to try to figure out what it, what it is. But let's just say that it was your adult self that said, it's good to bring this stuff out. Well, my outer child could say, well, I don't play games on my phone. But then what I'm not doing is I'm not identifying. I'm not joining i'm not using your disclosure to help me get take some of my shame away to help me to identify with you mm -hmm. um i'm not relating if i do that well i don't play games so what do i do on my phone i'm on my phone all the time i'm like it's not <laughs> my phone. it isn't a game but it's like a news but i don't know what it is it's like crazy stuff reading the same email that I've already read sort of mindlessly. It's all the same thing. And what that is, the getting on your phone, is that that is an outer child behavior because it's come become a habit mm -hmm. because it involves, you know, even the, the part of the brain that forms habits, it's actually an addictive habit because it involves oh, dopamine. Shit. You go on your phone and it rings bells and your dopamine and you release dopamine. The next thing you know, you really are addicted. Mm -hmm. So it actually is an outer child behavior and it serves so many purposes. We can, if we, we can get rid of boredom that way. We can kill time that way. We can, you know, it, it serves many purposes. We can cope with so many things because we can, we can transfer the focus onto that instead of onto something that's bothering us. And what is the ideal? The ideal is to be, you know, free of all the addictive behaviors and habits and to be, you know, thinking about what we're doing and being in the moment and, you know, all that. We all know what the ideal is. So it's a perfect example of an outer child behavior. And the other outer children in the audience could could be saying, well, I don't have that problem. But if they think about it, probably most everyone does. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about why it's so, so we have inner child feelings, we have outer child behavior. Can you talk about why it's so important that we separate the two? 
Well, being able to separate feelings from behavior is, is a very important thing and also very difficult. Freud was a fabulous theorist and broke real new ground with all of his theories, but he did not differentiate feelings from behavior. He created the concept of the id, mm -hmm. and the id is sort of a conglomeration of an inner child with the feeling and the behavior, the stimulus and the response. He didn't separate them. Um, so to be able to separate them is really good. Imagine if you were a parent and you had two kids, the little girl just hit her sister over the head with a truck. And your the little sister is crying her eyes out. And the little sister pulls the truck, tries to take the truck away, but the big sister is so mad and hits her over the head with a truck. So as a parent, you would say, if you can keep feeling separate from behaviors, you would say to your older daughter, you would say, I know you were angry at your little sister for stealing your truck. That's the emotion. I know you were angry because she was stealing your truck. So you validated the emotion, but hitting her over the head with a truck is unacceptable behavior. So as an as a parent, you would not allow your children to um, use unacceptable behavior. You validate the feelings, but you don't use them as an excuse for unacceptable behavior. That's an ideal parenting. So that's a case of separating feelings from behavior. So as adults, that's what we need to do. We need to say, this is what I'm feeling. And it's so subtle, it's so hard to catch yourself sometimes in avoidant behaviors and repetitive addictive behaviors and spinning your wheel behaviors that don't get you anywhere in life, that just keep you in your patterns. But you, you can identify the feeling. And if you can figure out what part of your behavior is self-defeating, then you can say, this is what I'm feeling, but... Um, watching, a, you know, binge watching a series on Netflix when I really need to get my ass out of the community and join and participate more in, in programs life. with people. Yeah. yeah, in life. So, you know, that's, that's what it is. It's separating the emotion from the automatic behavior. Yeah, I guess. And they're it's subtle. It's kind of like what I'm talking about, how like shaming myself isn't, making it any better right because it's like in that situation that you used with the kids if you don't separate it out then the child is going to receive the message that it's not okay to feel upset or angry right it is okay to feel that way but that's just not how we deal with it we don't hit somebody over the head with the truck when we feel angry yeah. I mean, to shame yourself is is to um, is to miss sort of miss the point. If you were parenting yourself, you wouldn't use shame it with one of your own children. You wouldn't. You're an idiot. You shouldn't be doing that. How, how stupid of you to do that. You would just say you're spending a lot of time on your phone. You're while you're doing that, you're not doing something else that might be better for you, that might be more productive. You're kind of whiling away the time. And maybe you want to consider what you're covering up with that. You know, if you, the adult part would never shame you for that. You would forgive yourself because you would say to yourself, I mean, I don't know you well enough to really say this, but I think I'm going to make a guess okay. that you are generally a very constructive person. If you take a few extra minutes out to watch, look at your phone, it's not like you're doing something that hurts other people. So there would be no reason to be terribly harsh with yourself. We're not talking a few minutes, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're not Alrighty. talking a few minutes. Uh, um, so, okay. Uh, what... Uh, like you said, it can be difficult. What if we're not sure what the underlying emotion is and how do we suss that out? We can see, we can see the self-sabotage behavior. We can identify the outer child, but we don't really know what it is that the inner child is feeling. Well, 
it's very hard to know what we're feeling because the behavior covers the feeling. Mm. Once you act it out, you're, you're now you're in this other place where you're actually creating new feelings because maybe your outer child behavior was to overreact and yell at someone or, you know, and now, now you have a new problem. So the original feeling gets very lost. So the, um, the program doesn't, you know, that there's so much easier said than done advice out there. Mm -hmm. Like the advice, be in touch with your feelings. Well, that's nice, but how do you do it? Mm -hmm. And then identify what you're feeling. Well, mm -hmm, but how do you do that? So the, the tool is a clunky tool. We talked about it um, last year. It's the tool. It's, it's the tool of writing a dialogue, creating a personification. It's a, creating a multiple personality disorder in yourself with an adult <laughs> self, which is the cerebral cortex part, as almost a separate being. And then an outer child part that's like this kid with the cap on backwards who's always doing the easy thing, you know, always trying to avoid and have fun and pleasure principle and immediate gratification, hates long-term goals, wants to do what it wants to do, very impulsive. So we, we have we personify that part of ourselves. And then we personify an inner child, which is we can imagine we're using our imaginations. These creatures don't exist, but we create them. Um, an inner child who's really, really small, because it's the inner child within the inner child that we're looking at here. Um, the traditional inner child that so many people have studied already is a little muckier. It's a little muddier concept because it contains both the emotions and the reactions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The inner child that I'm talking about is the younger, more pure emotional inner child. It's the part that feels. So we personify the part of us that's really just feeling, wanting, needing, angry, hopeful, we, we personify that as the inner child, as little you, and then outer child, and then the adult. So you create these three separate parts, and you, you actually make them more real by creating a dialogue. And the, the dialogue needs to start between your adult self and your inner child self. So if you were having a self-sabotage behavior like overeating, um, you would say to your inner child, big you would say, I want to ask you um, how you feel about the fact that we're, you're blaming the overeating as a behavior. You're blaming it on the outer child, right? You've personified it an outer child. That's your outer child doing that. All right. So now you have a fall guy to blame it on. And you, you, your adult self would say to your inner child, um, I want to know how you feel about you saying that your favorite carb is bread with that something on it. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel <laughs> that outer child wants to eat bread with something on it? Constantly. <laughs> bread and butter. Can we just say it? Bread and butter. <laughs> um, how do you feel that, that I'm so weak as your adult self that I let outer child eat all this bread and butter? And then you, you know, then you're always overeating with that. And that's how does that make you feel? And your inner child might say, I feel you don't care about me at all. I want you to take good care of me. And you don't, you let outer child eat bread and butter all the time and ruin everything. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, the dialogue would find that the most emotional part of that, which is how is your inner child feeling? Let's say with being being on doing game on your phone. How is doing your game. inner child? <laughs> yeah. How is your inner child feeling that you didn't get the other thing accomplished? Mm -hmm. That you didn't? Who knows what? Take a nice long walk, you know, or something like that. How does your inner child feel? And your child would say, "I feel you're letting outer child run the show." I don't feel you care about me. You, I feel very invisible. You don't really care about me. And if you did, you would want to know what I would like to do, what I think is important. And you never even asked me, you know, there would be a dialogue where you might find that your inner child really feels abandoned and neglected when you do that. Mm 
Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of, you don't really have to make it up in the dialogue. It's, you kind of, it's like a discovery process. You try not to put words in these personification. You try not to make it too contrived. You try to really get the different parts to, to really talk. Mm -hmm. And in order to do it, you have to be clear that the behavior is the outer child the feelings of the inner child and the reasoning part is the adult self. Are you ever talking to the outer child directly? Well, outer child is very clever, very can get away with murder. So you can talk to your outer child, but it's not going to go well. Your adult self can say, that's it. Stop it. I'm in charge now. And your outer child can say, okay. <laughs> like, for instance, I run abandonment workshops. Yes. And by about the second session, and let's say it's one of my online things, by the second session, people's outer child are saying to them, you can practically hear the outer child saying to the people it's on Zoom, you know, the outer child saying, go ahead and have your little workshop, but we're not changing anything. Go ahead, do your exercises, but we're not changing a thing. Outer child is very subtle and will does not want anything positive to change because it wants it wants to play games on the phone it wants to eat bread and butter it wants what it wants so it doesn't always go over too big when you try to engage your outer child because it'll just agree with you and then as soon as you're distracted over here it will go right on doing what it wants to do so the way to undercut its power is to have this very good relationship with your inner child where you know what you're feeling and you're, you're making um, the adult self is making a deal, a contract, a promise, a commitment to your inner child to do something constructive and good. Mm. Yeah. This is a lot more tangible for me. So I've been reading up about like internal family systems and it talks a lot about, the various parts going on there and like the protector and the, like some of it is very confusing. Um, I it's think a wonder the um, IFS is a great system, but it doesn't, the, the, it's a lot met more parts. Yes. And, the, and again, you personify those parts and make them work for you for a specific purpose in the yeah. therapy. This, the three parts, the inner child, outer child and adult, is it's just it, it has a different goal it's to heal the primal abandonment wound it's it's designed to get all the way to the primal abandonment wound it's something that we all have and the when we address just the feelings and we personify this sort of helpless part of us that's in there just feeling you know feelings are involuntary we can't help them so it's sort of a a helpless part that once we tune in and get in touch, we realize, oh, I'm feeling that. Um, but that the IFS has one goal. It's very good stuff. But this is the three part di diagram that I use is specifically to treat that it, that abandonment wound, the primal. And so do you think that whenever that whenever we are engaging in self-sabotage behaviors which i guess is i guess it, i was going to say is abandonment always involved and i guess it, yes because it's self-sabotage self is self-abandonment yeah mm -hmm. let's say the goal is to get fit mm -hmm. um i mean i i've worked with so many people who don't feel that they're healthy they have received doctors, you know, reports and so forth, and they know they really have to work at it. They can't just take their health for granted. They have to get fit. Mm -hmm. Well, it becomes really important, but they keep staying home instead of going down to the gym or they don't take the walk, even though they're telling themselves, I will take the walk. I will walk. I will. I will. And they, they don't. And all that what they're doing is they're abandoning themselves. So imagine how if they could get in touch with their inner child, how does their inner child feel? Well, they, the inner child says, you don't care if I live or die. You're, you really have abandoned me. You just let out or do whatever 
he wants. Adder can get away with murder, but you're not caring about what I want. I want to be healthy. I want to live. I'm scared. I don't feel good. I want to feel better. And you don't care about me because you keep giving in to outer. When you as the adult realizes that there's a part of you really feeling that self-abandonment, really feeling hurt inside, really feeling low about yourself and really feeling that you're not loved and you're not important enough and you're not special enough to go to that extra effort for it. Then you discover what your self-esteem issues are all about. You know, you start to feel the ache, the hurt, the lump in the throat of the inner child saying, if you loved me, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't let out or do that stuff. I was, have you ever heard of this? Um, it's called rapid resolution therapy. Have you ever heard of that? Let me take the letters. R -R well, there are, well, I know, but there's like RTT. There's all these different yeah, things. I know they all, they all have the same. So like, letters. I think Marissa Peer, is that her name? Hers is like RT, RTT, but this is RRT. I just interviewed this guy. Fascinating. But a few things that I didn't necessarily, uh, that I challenged him on. Um, but like one of the things was that he, he doesn't think that the recovery process, like that it can be pain free, which I don't know if I agree with that. But what I wanted to ask you is for this stuff, like when we're dealing with self-sabotage, self-abandonment, we're talking about, you're talking about like somebody needing to change their health. I, I personally feel like, and it varies but that we do have to essentially hit some sort of a bottom when it relates to all of this stuff to like actually be ready to do what's necessary to change. What are your thoughts? Well, let's, let's talk about that bottom because um, some people have a, a low bottom and then we go into why, you know, and that's the whole topic. That's the whole thing about the abandonment wound. Why is the bottom so low? Mm -hmm. But some people have a low bottom. So imagine if you had a low bottom and you're a little, little you. Imagine that your adult who's taking care of you, you know, your adult Andrea, isn't paying any attention to you. You practically have to die for her to say, oh, Little Andrea, what's the matter? What are you feeling? Mm -hmm. So what you're describing is hitting a bottom and your bottom and somebody else's bottom may be at all different levels. Some people hit a bottom the minute they notice that they start eating peanuts. That's their bottom. Oh, my God, I'm eating peanuts. They're so fattening. It's not good for me. I'll get cholesterol. What's What am I doing? Some people have a bottom that, that they have to become really unhealthy and practically die of, of some major, you know, artery issue or something mm -hmm. in, before they start. So, um, yeah, I think the bottom varies a lot, but it is the recognition that you become aware that you have one life to live and you become aware of the fact that what you really want isn't happening. Mm. The thing that you want more than anything is not something you're able to, is not within your grasp yet. That you become aware of the fact that your life seems more like a substitute life, like booby prizes for all the things you don't have. You become aware of the fact that as the adult in charge of giving you a life that would be you, you haven't done a good job in giving yourself the life that you want. The fact that you only have one life and you're squandering it. Okay, I say this in, in, with the um, knowledge that all of us can identify with that. Even people who, like celebrities who are living on top of the world, mm -hmm. could agree with, oh, yes, I'm not giving myself the life that I want. Mm -hmm. There's nobody, no matter how terrific things seem on the outside, who really feels that they are doing everything they can do to mm -hmm. to honor themselves mm -hmm. so that relationship between big you and little you mm -hmm. is an amends it's all about getting little you to say what do you want mm -hmm. I, I i haven't gotten that for you i'm sorry 
um, I'm listening to you. Tell me why it's so important to you. When I run my workshops and the people who write into my my uh, website um, for, I don't know, over 20 odd years and thousands of people do not have the relationship that they want. That there are some people who actually have a happy relationship and are actually fulfilled in that way. But the, I would almost, from my perspective, it seems like the majority of people don't have it. And little, little you is saying, but I want love. I want connection. I don't want to be lonely anymore. I don't want to be worried about, about whether I'm lovable anymore. You know, that's a, this is, goes on with men and women, all different levels of success, all different ages. And think about how once you start to get in touch with that and you realize how many substitute things you have indulged in instead mm -hmm. of going out and fixing that problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is this stuff is this isn't just a few people who are sort of doing a substitute life. This is all of us, me included. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this is the same thing. Um for just about every single person on the planet, we are all doing good things for ourselves at times. And then we're also substituting and wasting time and caught up in patterns and habits and missing doing the thing that would make little you really happy. Mm. So there's so much self-abandonment and it comes from the, the primal abandonment. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions for you is like, um, you know, an experience that you've had with taming your outer child. Well, I'm still taming my outer child. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a that I, I have so many outer child behaviors. Which one do I want to choose? Um, the one that I, I guess I without having to think too much is the, always the one about food. Mm -hmm. because if my outer child did what it wanted to do all day long, all I'd do is I'd get up and I'd start eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and just keep right on going with a hamburger and then on and on into the, into the day. Um, and <laughs> that the very fact that my mind focuses on that, the fact that it's such, you know, there's so much um, orientation in eating and the pleasure of eating, that's all outer child. Yeah. That is not that's my something that I remember you that's... sharing about your issues as a kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. It, it started in childhood. And my inner child is not saying, oh, I want my life to be all about food. <laughs> going on. My inner child says the same thing everyone else's inner child does pretty much. I want love. I want connection. I want to feel good about myself. I want to feel, I want to feel enough. I want to feel adequate. I want to feel satisfied. I want, inner, inner child is not wanting a, 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 an ice cream cone. That is the outer child. Mm -hmm. So there, my outer child really is always pushing the inner child away and getting the full attention. And when is my adult in charge? Whenever it can. It's like riding an elephant. If you think of a gigantic elephant and the elephant has a will of its own and we're sitting at the very top of the elephant on the back of the head trying to steer the elephant. That is the adult trying to deal with having an outer child. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's really the adult part of the adult of, of the personality. The adult part is the weakest of the parts. It developed last. It doesn't have the compelling emotional drives. It doesn't have the habits. It's the part that has to think and go through the pathways of thinking and using all the different parts of the mind in, in sort of a thought process to make decisions. It takes longer. It's more effort. So obviously I'm still going to go, I need to go through this book, but just to kind of like, so we have, we're getting in touch with the feelings. We're having the dialogue with the inner child. And then how does one then 
you know, kind of transition into taking positive action that's aligned with what the inner child wants? Well, you know, I, I, I will, I'll give the answer. <laughs> I will happily give the answer, but I just want to, uh, you know, explain to your, your, um, your audience here that this sounds so hard to talk about it and to describe it in this manner. You know, it just sounds so clunky. It is clunky. Even when you do it, it's clunky, but it sounds even clunkier to talk about it. But basically, <laughs> it really does. Because when you do it, it makes sense. You know, when if we were doing it sort of in a workshop way and all of us had a little pad of paper and we were practicing it. It, then then it starts to it starts to fall into place but clunky is a great um, word it's fun to say clunky. clunky yeah it is clunky clunky is a clunky word it's has uh. just the right it's it is a good word um but anyway that this is a good example of it but <laughs> so now when you have this dialogue with your inner child and you say to your inner child you're the adult self saying oh i hear you i'm gonna do better i'm I'm going to get help. I'm going to do everything I can to help you. I know I've left you kind of abandoned. I've let outer child get away with stuff. Your inner child is not really trusting you. Your inner child is thinking, yeah, right. Yeah. Said that. You're going to abandon me all over again. Mm -hmm. And there's only one thing you can do that really convinces your inner child, you, the adult self, not the, you, the adult self. The one thing you can do when you're having a dialogue with your inner child that will make your inner child feel loved, feel connected, feel hope, feel that there will be progress is when you, you promise to take a baby step and then you take the baby step mm. because in this dialogue, this sounds so corny, but words are cheap. Only actions count. It's just like in a relationship, somebody can say, I love you, I love you, I love you so much. And then they can go act unloving and selfish and not show caring. And it, it negates all those words. It's action that, that makes us feel loved. It's loving actions. That's what that's what reaches the heart. And the words don't really, the dialogue is important, but the words by themselves don't really do a thing. And what you have to do is turn the dialogue into a, 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 the result of the dialogue at the end. You would say to show you that I really am listening to you and that I really am planning to make a change. I'm going to take a baby step. And then you might admit, I can't think of one right now. I feel so um, stymied by what to do. I don't know quite what baby step I'm going to take. And then you can come back but you have to take that baby step you have to come back and say okay little you i'm i've come up with a baby step i'm going to take the step within 24 hours mm -hmm. and maybe the baby step is baby now ba a tiny baby step maybe the baby step is um i'm going to take you on a walk we're going to walk a half a block and on that walk, I'm going to be thinking about you, little you. I'm going to be thinking about what you're feeling, what you want from life, what's important to you, why you're disappointed, what I can do to help. I'm going to take a walk and every step I'm going to be thinking about you. So at least it's an action and there's physical exercise involved. You could say I'm going to take a long walk, but then will you do it? So you have to promise something so small that you would never break a promise because you're promising it to your own inner child. And, you know, you can't break a promise to a child. And that is especially true with your own inner child. So you have to come up with a tiny little step. Another baby step might be, I'm going to take, I'm going to the store and I'm buying a special notebook. And the notebook is going to be a notebook for you and me to talk. And I'm going to put that notebook right on my desk with a pen and I'm going to open it up and I'm going to put my cup of coffee right on it so that when I get up in the morning I have to get my cup of coffee and I'll remember the notebook and that way I'm set up to write to you again because your inner child is thinking you'll never talk to me again mm. they'll forget all about me 
now I've told you what I want and how I feel. You don't really care. You only give in to outer child. So the behavioral part comes from the dialogue. And as you do it every day or three times a week, nobody does it every day, but three times a week, hopefully, or two, two times a week is also good. But as you do it and you get kind of regular with it, um, you start making, you know, promises and you start following them through. Pretty soon the baby step are things like I'm calling, you know, I'm on this health kick, obviously, but there are so many other examples. I'm calling a dating service or I'm calling the gym to find out what the deal is. You're may actually going to take a bigger step. Okay. And they add up and they create momentum. And the next thing you know, you're running for president. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Not on my goals list. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, what? I think you shared it in the story, but where, where did you come up with the term utter child was with, your boy, Peter Yelton. Yes. My favorite quote ever. Oh, my God. Yes, Peter Yelton. We were having lunch. I don't exactly remember the words, but what's the quote that you're referring to? No, I'm referring to the quote that's that you, your favorite quote, too, that's in the other book and this one, too, about the drain, the invisible oh, drain. Oh, the invisible drain of self-esteem. Yeah. Abandonment is an, a severe enough trauma that it implants an invisible drain within the self that yeah. siphons off that no matter what you do to do esteemable things for yourself, to raise your self-esteem, the invisible drain of abandonment is always siphoning it away. Yeah, that fuck was you. Peter Yelton. It's so good. But no, but I think you were you got you guys were chatting when the outer outer I was Yes, the, the term outer was child. born yeah. Yeah. in that relationship the two of us are chatting and then it was not the inner child but the ah, the outer child and the next time we met for lunch peter had worked out a whole thing a whole scheme in his head and he's he was a font of creative information and a, an amazing therapist and just has so much insight so he's he's, he's, the he's still kicking father. it right Okay, I love okay. that on the podcast. Guess where he lives? In Florida? Uh-huh. I'm just going to have him on and I'm just going to have him say that one quote just over and over for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll have him throw in an outer child every once in a while. <laughs> okay, I have some questions from my listeners. <sighs> Well, actually, here's a question that I'd love for you to explain that I was reading about in the book that I thought was interesting. When you talk about how our fears tend to incubate, so I say incubate over time rather than dissipate. I love yeah. It. Well, you know, the outer child will try to convince you that if you're afraid of something, avoid it. Mm -hmm. You know, just don't do it and stay away from it. And so much of what we're doing, half the time you're gaming it could be avoiding something that you feel anxious about. Oh, doing, absolutely. Rather than that. Yeah. That actually because was a quote that I took from your book. It, I loved it. It is what I am saying is that avoidance is one of the outer child's favorite forms of self-sabotage. One that does more harm than good in the end. Why? Because while you're avoiding your fears are secretly gaining strength, not melting away. Yeah. Because what what has been found by in neuroscience um, is that fears do not they they don't um, dissipate with time. They don't when when you have a fear, it incubates the longer you leave it unaddressed. Mm. So here's a mistake that so a time lot of, does not heal all fears. Time doesn't no time creates a pocket whereby the fear can in, in get it larger. Mm -hmm. So as a child, um, you know, some of my childhood history, I was shy that made me shy and, and affected my self-esteem. So I had fear about certain social issues. So there was a long time that I avoided, I still do, many situations because of all the anxiety, why I put myself out there just remain quiet, remain in the background. 
But then I discovered all the stuff about abandonment and I had a reason to break through the fear of staying hidden. And the fear was larger. Now I'm more awkward, more, it was more difficult because of all the incubation of that anxiety, I had to break through that. And in breaking through it, it kind of lessened the fear. Not that I don't still have fear of rejection, of criticism, you know, of all of that. I still, of course, have that. I'm still human. I still have my heart and my soul. But it has the proportion of that fear is so much smaller. It's manageable. Mm -hmm. But while I was avoiding dealing with it, it had it had gotten really big. Um, the biggest example that I think most most people in the audience can identify with because it is so out there, it is so universal, is when you get hurt in a relationship, it could be in high school, it could be in college, it could be at any time in life, you get hurt. And many people are afraid to get back up on the horse again, or they've been hurt so many times, they just can't risk it again, it's too painful. So they avoid, they just do, do everything they can to avoid that vulnerability. And they, they can find a life without you know, being in a relationship, they have friends who feel the same way. So they, they develop a whole life that's good. But in the meantime, the fear that they've been avoiding dealing with, you'd think that now that they're, they've been doing this for years, now they're like, they could meet somebody, mm -hmm. they could get no. When they go, when they get vulnerable again, what they discover is that the fear has grown, that they're even more anxious, that they're more likely to freak out and sabotage it. So it's exactly the opposite of what the self-help books say. The self-help books say conventional wisdom. It's almost always wrong. Mm -hmm. It says if you start to get into a new relationship and you're anxious and you're overreactive, it means you're not ready. Mm -hmm. That is just not true. Mm -hmm. It could mean that it mm -hmm. could mean that there's stuff that you still, you know, that you're still working out. But from my experience, that's the minority of cases that you're not ready because you're still too much in the throes of the previous abandonment. My experience is that if, that you are insecure and it's a necessary hurdle that your next relationship and the vulnerability that it brings is inevitable almost because you've been hurt so it is natural to be more afraid and that is not a sign that you're not ready it just goes with the territory and what has to be done here is the courage to be able to say i can withstand what happens even if it doesn't work out i can pick myself up dust myself off and go back out there again. Yeah, that was another part in the book. I was just looking to find out that I highlighted. Um, totally agree. I, you know, I'm a big advocate on like taking a break and focusing on yourself. But then once you do dip your toe back in the pond, that like it's not going to be all easy breezy, right? Like it's gonna fucking suck. Um, <laughs> but this is what I really like what you said. So you go, but when you finally think you're ready to meet someone, one of two things can happen. You say one no one turns you on even though they look great on paper or two someone does turn you on and you're suddenly so vulnerable that you can barely stand being in your own body so you want to break down those two points so number one no one turns you on well when you've been hurt okay this is it's a complicated answer i think we've talked me, about maybe. this before yeah but when you've been hurt and you're you're recover in recovery from, from the previous hurt. It could be 10 years ago or even more recently. Well, not to, sorry, not to interrupt you, but this is the one thing that I've always noticed, right? Is like when I get out of a relation, I've never been able to hop to another one because it's like the person could be like the most amazing person in the world. And it doesn't matter. Like I dated like a two and then I come across a 10 right afterwards, not interested. I think it's, yeah, I've always just been fascinated how people can just go from one to the next but sorry go ahead that was just yeah yeah okay well that's a whole other issue of the fact that you, i think i'm built more like you i'm so vulnerable i it just i can't find anyone interesting and uh, i can't let's either address, yeah go ahead let's address that <laughs> one first because right. 
it's I'm sure so many people have this. It's because your emotional brain has an object and the object is the last guy you were with. Yep. Okay. So the new person is not her, him or her. I don't mean to be so gendered, but the, the new person is not that person. This person is occupying that special place in your brain. And therefore, as long as you're not meeting the exact replica with the same everything, name and everything, your emotional brain is saying, no, nope, not, not a match. So that that has a lot to do with it. What's going um, on there though? Like why are there some people, because I think that there's people that are anxious attachers, right? Why is it that some people are wired that way? And then why is it that, because for me, I mean, to me, it seems like it would be a lot easier if I could just like be attracted to somebody else really quickly right after. Like, why are some people able to do that? And other people aren't like, what's going on there? Oh boy. Well, I mean, some people are looking for substitutes. There's more of a narcissistic component. It's, it's a very complicated answer. There's a narcissistic component for some people. So they're looking to have, they're not really looking to make a deep connection, even though they may think they are. They're really looking for somebody to say, hey, you're hot. I really desire you. And that somehow assuages the narcissistic injury of being rejected. Hmm. But a lot of people who go right back out, there are people who weren't the who weren't rejected. Reject mm -hmm. the pain of rejection. Having somebody dump you and walk away from you. You want the relationship. They don't. When that happens and you've been rejected, that wound is that hurts a great deal. But for some people, that creates more the injury. For everyone, it's a narcissistic injury, no matter who you are. But for some people. They're able to respond to flattery. So the next person who gives them attention kind of makes them feel better. Whereas flattery is oh, cheap. It's not going to do yeah. it for you. It doesn't. No, it's the person. It's okay. the person. So then number two, suddenly someone does turn you on and you're suddenly. So, I mean, I just think that this is to be expected. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, the other thing that happens and um, is that if you don't know how to handle the feelings, your emotional brain, the wiring kind of thing, I'm using this analogy, you know, mm -hmm. metaphorically, mm -hmm. but the, the wiring in your brain now is attracted to the unavailable because the abandoner was unavailable. So mm -hmm. now it takes another unavailable person to turn you on. You know, there's a lot of numbing in order to come out of the abandonment, the pain is so terrible that you, 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 so there's sort of a scar tissue with a lot of numbing. And if you don't know how to handle the feelings, if you're not in touch with little you and everything that she's going through, it would be easy for the numbing to lead to someone who's unavailable because that is a familiar feeling chasing the unavailable, not being loved, almost being loved, but not quite. That's what's familiar. So um, when no you're shit. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the biggest one. That is number one problem out there. I mean, it's being a being, I call it a band being attracted to the unavailable. And if somebody who was unavailable who's very attractive, suddenly becomes very available, you lose the attraction. Mm -hmm. You start to notice, you know, their table manners aren't so good and they, they make a grammatical error that's so annoying. And, you know, you start to find fault with them if they become super available. And available means they're saying to you, hey, we get together Thursdays and Fridays. Let's add Saturdays. How come we can't get together for the whole weekend? Why don't you come over and we'll cook together on Sunday? Let's go away for a week together. Mm -hmm. And they start getting real available and starting to build on the relationship. And now they're no longer unavailable. So they're no longer attractive. And that that causes the attraction to cool off quite a bit. Okay, Susan. So I've done all this damn work on myself, gone to therapy, everything, taken long dates from break uh, dating. 
But I have it's like the one person that I really got jazzed up about was somebody who he was no he was separated, but he was not yet divorced. What the hell? <laughs> you know, like that like concerns me. Like, is what is that? Is that is that just to be like is that just to be expected? Like, is that ever gonna go away completely? Does does this does the, the, the does the fact that I still get activated by somebody who's emotionally unavailable is that just something that's hardwired in me that I'm always just gonna have to be cognizant of? Well, you're a co- you are cognizant of it now. Yes, and um, it, it's there's again. I mean, there are so many different directions to take that question, but <laughs> one way we could we could look at it. We could examine whether there's a triangle thing in your, in your pattern. Mm -hmm. If your relationships are you, him and his previous girlfriend or you, him and his daughter from the previous marriage or you, him and his mother, who's he's too close to, or whether there's a problem in your family, in your family of origin, where you were part of a triangle or at other times in your life where you were part of a triangle. At which point it would be very natural for you to be res- emotionally responsive and feel needy and itchy around someone who's got who's got still an engagement going on. Now, if this guy is still married, he may hate his wife, but he's but she still has power mm-hmm. in some economic power, some kind of power. So that puts you in a situation where he he can't be totally available. Mm-hmm. he's not as available as you are mm-hmm. you're more available because you're unencumbered mm-hmm. supposedly i don't know maybe you're quite encumbered for all <laughs> <laughs> yeah well no it's good i mean i was able to walk away and you know sit through the feelings but, but your your question is um does this last forever and the answer is it can. It can be such a persistent pattern. You have to work like hell to get rid of it. But the fastest way, you know, this dialogue that I told your your you know your audience about that is such a clunky dialogue. It really is the most effective tool I have found. So if because little you wants doesn't want that. Little you really wants oh. to be loved. Mm-hmm. She's not playing games. You know, she's that's out her child. Dark. That needs that that stimulation of chasing the unavailable. That's all outer child stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> Fun. Fun times. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see here. Um, I'm not able to get to all. Okay, well, how about this? I thought this was a good question. So how do we respond when our partner internalizes our actions as abandonment or rejection? She goes, often... The result was a long circular conversations where he would have a tone, tone of frustration and anger if I did not give him what he desired of me. And this is when your partner has abandonment issues? Internalizes, yeah, and internalizes your actions as abandonment or rejection. I'm assuming she means like when she's trying to do what's right for her. And that that's interpreted by a partner as abandonment or rejection. Well, I don't think that came from one of my books, right? No, this is a question because, from a listener. Okay, from a listener? Yeah. Okay, so um, the idea that um, you can be in a relationship, every relationship has, you know, there's one person who's more the abandoner and one person who's the distancer, one person who approaches Mm -hmm. and the other person avoids, you know, there's a little seesaw going on. And, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you take turns. Sometimes you're the one needing the extra assurance and Mm -hmm. sometimes it's the other person. If the, if she's in a relationship with someone who has, at least at this time has more abandonment issues and is more sensitive to abandonment than she is Mm -hmm. 
the the antidote to that is you know it, it means that she won't have as much pleasure in the relationship because she's got to take care of somebody else's feelings mm -hmm. and constantly be you know clarifying herself but the antidote to that is really good communication because if she can get her partner to really talk about what's going on emotionally and recognize that it's not about this relationship. It's about issues that predated this relationship. If, if they can really talk about stuff, they can bring their relationship more to the present. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, communication is such an important thing in a relationship. It's so great to be able to say, you know, your abandonment issues, I feel for you for having them, but they also make me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just so important to just put it out there and to own your own feelings, not to say you're making me feel. But when when you start to express all these issues of yours, I feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. OK, last I'll just ask this one question. This is a good one. I don't know. This is kind of hard to answer, I think. But how does one differentiate? When in the here and now, as an adult, when you are truly being emotionally abandoned in a relationship, and when it is just the vestiges of childhood trauma of emotional neglect. Yeah. Or is it me or is it child. is it me yeah. or is it them? I mean, that's a huge question that's oh, that's out there so much. That question am I just being overreactive? Am I being insecure? Or is is this person emotionally unavailable? You know, I don't want to make up excuses for them. Is it me or is it them? I, I don't know who's the one doing this. It, mm -hmm. It's so hard to make that determination. Mm -hmm. And the answer is not a very popular answer, um, but it's the, very often you can't figure it out. It isn't, you can't figure it out. You don't know if, you know, you can talk to friends and therapists, but then, you know, it's, it, you're, you're influencing their answer by the way you're posing your question. So you can't, it's very hard to, to figure out, is it them or is it me? Mm -hmm. But you can find out how little you is feeling inside. You can, you can actually forget that question and recognize that you're in a situation that's ambiguous because it's a new relationship and nothing is, there are no guarantees. And the important thing is that you have a relationship with yourself. Because if you have a love relationship with yourself, in other words, if you have self-love, mm -hmm. um, then you don't need another person to complete your loop. It's mm -hmm. nice when they do, but if they don't, you still have yourself. So you that relationship that you're building with yourself where you're discovering what you're feeling and you're, you're increasing your motivation for giving yourself as good a life as you can because you love yourself, that relationship becomes the, the important thing. And it actually almost makes those questions go away. Um, okay. Do you have anything you want to promote? Are you working on anything? I have all these workshops coming up. I have a workshop at this gorgeous place in the Blue Ridge Mountains called Art of Living Institute. It's the most beautiful place. It's up at the top of the Blue Ridges with views that and it's it's just a glorious, beautiful place. Mm. That's coming up. I it's on my website at abandonment.net on under workshops. Another one is coming up at Kripalu. These are coming up soon, like within a month or two. Um, and that's that's the workshop at Kripalu in Massachusetts. And then I have an online workshop that I'm gonna be doing five sessions coming up in the spring. Beautiful. And I have I have um videotapes of all the different Akeru exercises from exercises one through five that take you through the whole program from you know from going through this whole process all the way to discovering your future self and working toward your ultimate goals. I love it. That's also, on my you, website also. Okay. Well, next time we can talk about that. I mean, there's so many things we can talk about, but we'll have, we're, you're going to be an annual guest, Susan. Okay. Good. Okay. See you next year. <laughs>
As always, I know you heard something that you could relate to. And if you didn't, you got some issues, <laughs> you need to damn the join Patreon. And also, too, if you did get something out of it as well, like, you should also damn the join Patreon, too. Uh, thanks to Susan. She's so great. She's extremely down-to-earth, easy to talk to, a really, really, really rad woman. Um, I'll be honest. It's I, I slipped. I've been getting the episode, this part done a lot earlier uh, in the day over the past few weeks, but it's 9.15 now, so I'll just uh, own that shit. But I was going to sit down around 4, but then I... I still haven't gotten my fucking furniture. <laughs> Sorry. That's why I didn't record earlier because uh, my furniture is supposed to get here. Well, it's it's almost been nine weeks, guys. And it's like for the past several weeks, it's been, it's coming next week and it's coming next week. And then finally, it's, I just, I just kind of lost it today. I haven't really gotten angry about it, but I, I got real fucking pissed off today. And, um... I didn't want to want to come on and uh, the energy was just off. Okay. So I have a a, uh, reasonable, I think an understandable excuse as to why it's later. Um, what else? I don't know. What do I have? Oh, I mean, I have a potential, I may have a potential date. Uh, it is, it's, it's slim pickings here, guys on the, on the dating apps. So we got one person that's possibility. We'll see how that goes. That's it. That'd be it, y'all. I will see you next week for another fucking amazing episode of Adult Child. It's gonna be super awesome, mama. Super excited. Get out of here. It's gonna be a good day. I promise.